Welcome everyone, I'm Maurizio Caschetto, the editor of the Legacy of John Williams website. I'm happy and honored to host this special online event celebrating one of the most special relationships in the history of music, John Williams and the London Symphony Orchestra. Joining me to host this unique celebration is one of my dearest friends and collaborators, film music journalist and board member of the Film Music Foundation, Tim Burden. Hello, Tim, and thank you for being here with me today. Thank you, Maurizio. Hello, and welcome indeed to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here to celebrate and shine a spotlight onto this collaboration with John Williams and the London Symphony Orchestra. So the special relationship is what, what uh, this is, I suppose, a tagline as such. We have uh, a great roster of guests, and uh, firstly, we're honored to have uh, Sue Mallet with us. And Sue has been uh, administrator and the um, planning contractor, as well as the now planning director of the, of the uh, magnificent LSO. And Sue, great to have you here with us as one of the earliest John Williams uh, collaborators. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Um, and indeed, I think my greatest fame this evening is actually having been working with the LSO back in the 1976, 77. So I was here from the very beginning of the John Williams collaboration. Um, and I've got some stories to tell about those early days. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, that's what we love to hear. Brilliant, and then Mauricio and myself are also thrilled to have some of the most iconic uh, musicians with us and certainly no, no more so than Sir Clive Giddenson, who was a, a cellist in the early days of the LSO the, during the early 70s. And then, uh, of course, the unique tenure of being the managing director of the LSO, uh, specifically from the 1984 to 2005. Uh, Clive, wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Tim, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, <clears throat> this relationship was really one of the things that defined the LSO for a very long time, and it John is such a special person, as well as such a great artist. And I think for all of us, it was a great thrill to work with him. And for me, I was in the 1976 performances, you know, all the um, recordings we made, 76 through to 84, and then worked with him as manager after that. So I've seen many sides of, of John and the relationship with the orchestra. Mm, indeed. And you are over there on that side of the pond uh, in America. <coughs> and so appropriately as well, one of your colleagues and uh, fantastic musicians during that pivotal era of music is uh, David Cripps, who was principal first horn and playing between 1977 and 1983. Uh, you'll know his, uh, his formidable sound, which you know has graced screens and our, uh, our speakers and headphones from Princess Leia's theme to of course the, um, the wonderful binary sunset, that iconic Ben's theme or, or the Force theme as it later became known. David Cripps, thank you for being here with us. You're very welcome. And I'm glad to be here with you, Tim, you, Maurizio, and also all my colleagues and ex-colleagues. It's, uh, it's just fun to be here and also a great honor to be able to pay some kind of tribute to John. Uh, there've been many, many tributes um, over the years, but uh, I, I remember those sessions so clearly, as both Sue and Clive have said, uh, it was a pivotal moment for the LSO. And so it's good to be here. We are also glad to have uh, some LSO members of the younger generations who performed 
in the more recent scores John recorded in London on several other recordings, of course, also, namely the Star Wars prequels and the Harry Potter films. Uh, first, we have violinist Maxine Kwok. Hello, Maxine, and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's it's quite nice for Dave and I to be called a, the younger, <laughs> the younger sort of generation. We probably don't really feel it. Um, certainly, those the Star Wars sessions um, I did, uh, Menace would have been pretty much the first things I I did in Yorkshire. And being a a true big Star Wars fan and a fan of John Williams, I can I can talk to the cows come home about what I think, um, how amazing he is and how he's, he's just changed the face of, of film music. And just, it's always a joy to work with him and play his music. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And, and also we have percussionist LSO, percussionist David Jackson. Hello, David, and thank you for being with us too. Hi Maurizio, hi everybody. It's um, <clears throat> just like Maxine, I'm, I'm thrilled to be referred to as the younger generation. Um, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that feels like an awfully long time ago now, but uh, no, I mean, I, I'm exactly in the same boat as, as Maxine. I grew up totally in love with these movies and more importantly with the music. Um, I've, I've got, I see Tim's got his, uh, LP at the back there. I dug mine out because it's it's such a precious thing to me. This was actually the first thing that really convinced me that I wanted to be an orchestral player. And I think that's true for a lot of the, the, the generation of, of myself and Maxine in the orchestra. Being a fan of the movies and a fan of that music is, is what wanted to make me play in the LSO from a very early age. So again, I'm thrilled to be here and, and just like Maxine can talk endlessly about my love for John and my love for his music. So it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for being with us, uh, David. And, and what you just said, I think it's uh, really an essential element of what makes John Williams' music uh, really a very special for, for everyone and especially for people who grew up in the late 1970s up to, to today, actually, because his music really touched at least now two generations of people and many of them fell in love by listening to the sound of the symphony orchestra, namely, in many cases, the London Symphony Orchestra, and decided to become musicians. And that's one of the greatest gifts that John has done to the music community all around the globe. Uh, but first, I'd love to put things a little bit into an historical context, because I think it's very fascinating to look at John's uh, career uh, and what brought him to London and to become a, a staple of the London musical scene. Uh, John Williams, uh, in the late 1960s, was starting to move away from his status of a Hollywood composer, mostly for sophisticated comedies, thanks to projects that really brought him a little bit for, for a short amount of time away from Los Angeles. In fact, in 1968, he spent the majority of the year in London writing and recording for a film musical based on Goodbye, Mr. Chips, which brought him subsequently his second Academy Award nomination. According to producer and historian Mike Matticino, who wrote some fantastic program notes for the concert in... Uh, 2018, the concert that John was supposed to conduct, but uh, sadly he fell ill and then he had to, Dirk Brosset stepped in as a substitute conductor at the Royal Albert Hall. Uh, according to Mike Matesino, the composer was very happy with his work in London back in the late 60s, that he looked for more opportunities to return to the city of London anytime he could. A couple of years later, he returned to London to work on the adaptation of the hit musical Fiddler on the Roof, which was a resounding success, uh, a box office success, and also brought him his first Academy Award for, uh, for adaptation. So during the same year, John also worked on a beautiful score for a television production based on uh, the novel Jane Eyre. He recorded the score at Anvil Studios in Denham, uh, working with a pickup orchestra, but most of the principal members were uh, principals of the LSO, uh, especially uh, principal flute Peter Lloyd. The success of these works put John Williams higher on the map of the up-and-coming film composers uh, from Hollywood and laid the foundation uh, for his affinity with the London music scene. Uh, and of course, with the LSO, 
because back then Andrew Previn was the principal conductor of the London Symphony Orchestra and was very, very close friend with John Williams. And in fact, what I uh, found in my research work was that the very, the very first collaboration between John and the LSO isn't Star Wars, as most of the people may, um, may believe, but actually was in 1972 in the performance of his uh, first symphony, which was conducted uh, by Andrew Previn in, his, in its European premiere at the Royal Festival Hall and later also at Nottingham Festival. So I know that some of the people here, namely uh, Sir Clive Gillinson, was already a member of the orchestra back then. So Clive, do you have any kind of recollection of John Williams' first symphony back in 1972? Um, awkward question. <laughs> um, I mean, I do. I think, you know, what is fantastic about John, I mean, the, you know, the colors, the understanding of how to write for an orchestra. Um, you know, and as time went by, I, I, what was wonderful was because of his relationship with the LSO, he wrote more and more with the particular players in mind, people like Maurice Murphy, David Cripps, I mean, so many of the great star players. Um, you know, John really loved their playing. So, I mean, this was in fact his first, as you say, his first performance with the LSO. Um, and at the time when he was wanting to find an orchestra for Star Wars and, and then obviously his continuing work, it was Andre Previn who he asked um, who he should involve. And it was Andre who suggested the London Symphony because John really didn't know the orchestra much before then. Most of his work, I think, had probably been in America. Um, so this really was the beginning of such a phenomenal relationship and one that I've enjoyed because, in fact, I still keep in touch with him and we still present him and his music at Carnegie Hall to this day. And that's fascinating. I mean, uh, what I believe is very interesting is the fact that back then, Andrew Previn was a key figure uh, for the London Symphony. Of course, he was putting the orchestra so much in the spotlight thanks to his work and also his courage to present new music, namely, you know, uh, modern music uh, written by uh, living composers besides you know the usual symphonic classic literature that of course the LSO is a great staple in but uh, do you think uh, that Previn brought some kind of let's say Hollywood glamour to to the London musical scene I mean he certainly did and you know when it, because partly his marriage to Mia Farrow there were so many dimensions of this but also because Andre was really the first person since Leonard Bernstein who had this extraordinary ability to communicate with audiences in every way. Um, somehow, uh, you know, he could talk to people who were musical experts and kids who knew nothing about music at one and the same time. So Andre Previn's Music Night um, became a huge success and vast numbers of people um, watched classical music. And I think he transformed the position of classical music in London music through his work on television and through all of his skills in that area. And um, it was quite unprecedented to have a principal conductor who could do it in that way. And the, the orchestra benefited hugely from that. Um, if I could come in here, um, I have uh, a little memory of that um, John Williams Symphony Number no. 1 performance. I was the third horn in the London Symphony at that time, 1972. And I remember it very clearly. I don't remember the piece very much, I'm afraid. But the thing that I do remember is that at that time, uh, the most famous John Williams in music was the classical guitarist. <laughs> and, uh, and so I do remember that John Williams' symphony, uh, it had to be billed as John T. Williams. And I, I remember that so, so clearly. And uh, I remember having a chat to him as he was sitting there listening to the rehearsal in the Royal Festival Hall. And I thought, what a gentleman, what a nice, nice person. And um, to this day, that has not changed at all. He's very modest, very unassuming, despite everything that he's done for music and musicians. Whenever you say that, David, it's uh, appropriate. Uh, Terry Jones sends his best. He, sorry he couldn't be with us tonight. But uh, as you know, Terry uh, played Return of the Jedi um, solos. And I think it was also the, the fourth horn on the, the first Star Wars. 
And he was actually the, the home player who started with Williams, even back, goodbye, Mr. Chips, and Jane Eyre, Fiddler on the Roof. So mm -hmm. he uh, he does recite exactly that phrase, David. And he, he recalls Williams being a little bit like, um, I think he just got off the tube coming out of um, you know London, and he was a bit disorientated. And I think he had a friend with him from New York. This is at the, the goodbye, Mr. Chip sessions. And... I think he, he always got on well with the musicians so well, as of course you know, because he's a musician himself. He, he knew the kind of session and the studio scene, and he has this kind of uh, general, you know, generous uh, warmth, and it's a very genuine warmth, I should say. And I love how I know David uh, showed off his LP there, but when, you know, whenever we're, we're looking back to Star Wars and, and that iconic LP with you know, such heartfelt words from Williams himself, you know, and this is always uh, such a treasure. Obviously, seeing all the musicians listed here is is key, and, but he, he's so, he's praising you in such a, a, a lovely way, you know, and, it, and it's really, I mean, when thinking back to that era, Sue and Clive and, and, and David, you must, you know, whenever you've got this in your hands, the, the final finish recording and seeing his words and commentating on each, track it must have been such a lovely uh lovely thrill for you all i'm sorry if you start my recollection of first meeting john because back in the 60s and 70s many conductors got their results by sheer fear they put you know the sheer fear into the players but i never i've never heard john raise his voice he knows he you know, knows exactly how to get what he wants and he, I think, probably is one of the most charming people I've ever met. But he has a fantastic sense of humour, which actually came to play when we did the Albert Hall concert with him in 1978. Um, it was very, it was good fun because we felt that we should put on a concert because I think, and as Clive has already mentioned, that the very first session of Star Wars in the Anvil Studios of Denham. I mean, I remember going there and you could see just everybody smoked in those days. And the whole studio was this sort of haze of cigarette smoke. And they were projecting the film onto the back, a big screen at behind the players. And I also have a memory of 20th century asking the LSO whether they would actually take a royalty instead of the fees. Um, <laughs> I mean, sadly, it wasn't an option for us because um, the LSO is self-governing and they're not a salaried orchestra. And even if we had known the huge phenomenon that Star Wars would become, in those days we could never have afforded to pay the players because they were paid and still are per working session. And the LSO did not have any sort of resources to even contemplate that but of course none of us had any notion of the success that star wars would become and i remember everybody sitting in that studio with this haze of smoke turning around and sort of looking at these extraordinary goings on um, being projected onto the wall and thinking what on earth is this all about but everybody came away going this music is sensational. And I think that I've never known the impacts that a composer's had on an orchestra or on, on the LSO that those early sessions had on our players. And so we immediately said, we've got to put some of this into concert. And I don't know when John first decided to issue his signature edition because what's so clever about John Williams's scores is that you can, anybody can buy very cheaply, you know, the themes from all the music, be it Jaws, Raiders, Star Wars, Superman, and he's always written symphonically. I mean, I can't recall him ever using synths in his scores. Everything he's done has been symphonic, which means everybody has a chance to perform his scores in the way they should be performed. He also has, has a, a horror of takedowns. 
And I think this probably also inspired him to make his music available to amateurs, professionals. Um, but as I say, we it had such an impact on the LSO. So in February 78, we decided to put on a concert in the Albert Hall. But as David Cripp said, John Williams and John T. Williams, people only knew the guitarist even then. Um, but everybody knew who C3PO was. So the concert wasn't selling. And we decided that we would get the costume from 20th Century Fox of C3PO and put in a musician to come on and conduct an encore because we felt that publicity would do the trick for us. And we spoke to 20th Century who said, well, there's only one person this will fit and that's Anthony Daniels. It takes him four hours to get into the costume. And what I hadn't realized till I actually encountered Anthony Daniels as C3PO, he had tunnel vision and couldn't really hear anything, which is not ideal if you're trying to conduct an orchestra. And, but John entered into this with huge gusto and spent hours teaching and um, teaching the Anthony Daniels how to uh, conduct the theme. And we then advertised C3PO. And in fact, R2 T, R2D2 also came and had a position up by the Timps, David. Um, not that anybody knocked him on the head with this, uh, with the sticks, but R2D2 was up there as well. But we sort of, it was, it was, an amazing moment and it brought the house down when C3PO came on to conduct the encore. But John loved it and he, we have lots of pictures in our archives of John and C3PO posing by London taxis, the famous, you know, the famous London buses outside the Albert Hall. Um, yeah, it, it, I loved working with him right the way through. The earliest memories, you know, they're so clear because it was so exciting and something so new with somebody who was really unknown. Yeah, and that's that's really one of the key things that I, I'd I'd love to 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 talk with you, and and I'd love to you know to bring in a a, a little a very short musical fragment to to remind us about what about what would probably the players felt the first day of recording. In fact, according to the recording log of the first Star Wars school, John started the session, the very first session, on March 5, 1977, with a cue which isn't the main title, actually. So I'll let you listen now to the cue that was the very first Star Wars music that was ever played uh, anywhere in the world. And um, it's a very, very short but very exciting piece of music. And I guess we can really... Imagine what the thrill of the people who were playing this incredible music.
So that was the very first cue that John Williams recorded with the London Symphony Orchestra on March 5, 1977. And I guess I guess that most of the musicians present on the recording stage, you know, started to feel that this was something special. And I'd love to ask David Cripps, especially if he remembers any of this type of music that he performed, because the horns here are very prominent. <laughs> Oh, prominent on just about every every cue, I think. Um, I have so many memories of that. Uh, the, the biggest memory that I have, and maybe it's because I've been a US citizen for 10 years and I've been living and working here for so long. Uh, people, I, I've dined out on Star Wars for so long, you know, so many people. They don't want to know about me playing principal horn in Mahler Five or Beethoven symphonies or Brahms symphonies. It's everything is Star Wars, and it's uh, they never want to talk about anything else. Uh, but when they hear that I played the Princess Leia's theme for the first time, people go absolutely crazy, <laughs> and um, that's that's my story and my memory more than anything is the, um, the recording of that, which was, um, it was the end of a three session day. We had lots of three session days on Star Wars. Do you remember Clive? And um, it, halfway through an evening session, uh, the personnel manager got in front of us and said, uh, Mr. Williams would like a half hour's overtime tonight. Is that okay? Well, as brass players, our lips were, pretty much shot to pieces. They were hurting by that time, but of course it was John Williams and uh, uh, it was film sessions. And so we said, yes, we will. And we had no idea what was going to come, but as soon as we agreed to do the overtime, the, um, the, the parts came out, the, uh, the orchestral scores, um, the copyists had been very busy and I'm, I'd like to think that the ink was still wet when my part was put in front of me on the first horn stand. And it just said solo. And I looked at it. There was no time to, uh, to practice it or anything like that. And John came out and said, thank you for agreeing to do the overtime. He said, we have to do one more cue tonight, which I'd like to get in. And uh, he looked across at the heavy brass the trumpets, trombones, tubas, and said, um, I know you've had a hard day, but don't worry too much. He said, this is going to be a nice, gentle number. And then before we actually rehearsed it, he looked straight at me and he said, uh, David, I've written a little horn solo for you. I hope you enjoy it. And I remember him saying that so clearly with a little twinkle in his eye. And I had no idea that this was going to be one of the horn solos, you know, right up there with Tchaikovsky Five and Mendelssohn Nocturne and whatever. It's, it's actually, it's one of the most beautiful solos that any composer has ever, ever written for the horn. And I feel so privileged that John told me, I've written it for you. Yeah, that's an amazing story, really, because I think that... That is a testament, of course, of the great ability uh, as a sight readers that the LSO was always been known for. And of course, John probably was also accustomed to because, you know, we know that in L.A. he was used to the, all the studio musicians that are very good sight readers. So he was probably expecting the same from, <laughs> from, from the London Symphony Orchestra. But really, this is something that really put the score into uh, probably that extra level, because I think that uh, I, I distinctly remember the first time I heard uh, that cut on the soundtrack album, and really remembering that those that piece wasn't anywhere in the film, but I was totally mesmerized by it, even even if I wasn't associating with any of the scenes or any of the specific moments of the movie, it was truly fascinating to hear. And then starting to focus my attention, and I was really a toddler, basically, uh, on, on the sounds of the orchestra. And that magical horn solo is really, really a transfixing moment for, for really 
any musician. And I'd love, since we, we've just talked about it, I'd love to make it listen to, to everyone because I think it, it's deserving to, to, to the artistry of, of David who just told this beautiful story. So let's hear a, a brief snippet of Princess Leia's theme. <laughs> And that's, I think, an incredible, incredible moment. I think that that's a steering every any any music lover in the world. I think I enjoyed playing it. I, I have no idea how many times, how many takes we did of that. And I think John knew that everything that he was writing for this movie was going to be released on audio. And, and was going to go around the world forever and ever and ever. So it had to be absolutely perfect. I do remember that um, uh, one of the players sitting right next to me uh, was actually a principal horn in the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And uh, he, he got very agitated at the number of times I was being asked to play it. And he kept saying to me, you can't do it again. He says, tell him you've done it enough times now. And I said, no, 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 it's okay. We'll just go on until John's satisfied. And it, it, that was, that's kind of a sequel to my story. <laughs> but one of the things as well, which John Williams is so renowned for mm -hmm. is, is the dynamic writing for percussion. And, you know, we, we heard obviously in a quite pronounced bit of mixing there uh, from Eric Tomlinson and his team at Anvil uh, during Rescue the Princess. And, I mean, David, you, Jackson, you were saying, you know, thinking back to that LP, it was one of the things that inspired you to do what you do. And because of William's family history with percussion, you know, his father being a drummer, and then obviously his brothers are still active in the studio scene in Hollywood. Do you, would you say that, you know, you obviously are listening out to that percussive element of his scores, I'm sure, but do you find something particularly special uh, in his uh, percussive writing? Um, before I answer that question, Tim, I, I'd just like to say I'd, I'd got goosebumps listening to David's story there because this is this is my sort of music education for many years. I know those, I know that horn solo so well, I can hear all the, the, the shifts with the embouchure. They're so ingrained in me, and it's it's just absolutely wonderful to hear that firsthand from from the guy that did it. So thank you, David, for relaying that wonderful story. It was absolutely fascinating to to sit here as a you know a sort of second generation, if you like. But going back to your 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 question, Tim, yes, absolutely. Um, um, I mean, John has all had always written so brilliantly for percussion it's so inventive it's so just enough and never invasive but so exciting to play i mean one of the tracks that really sort of lit my fire was the the battle in the snow from empire um i i remember listening to the the percussion break towards the end of that cue and thinking these guys are just geniuses playing wise but who, who comes up with that stuff in their mind to write that kind of 
interesting percussion um, repertoire for, 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 a, for a film. I mean, it was just breathtakingly beautifully played, but also the, the conception of it in the first place, it, it just blew me away absolutely every time. And that, that carried through right through to the prequels. I mean, I was, I'm sure Maxine will say the same. We just, those of us who'd grown up with those first three soundtracks, going into Abbey Road and, and starting um, Phantom Menace, I just felt like a kid in a sweet shop and all my dreams had come true because all I ever wanted to do from hearing David's Princess Lear theme all those years ago was play in that orchestra. I, I didn't want to play in any other orchestra apart from the LSO because I saw on the front of my double sleeve album, you know, original soundtrack composed and conducted by John Williams performed by the London Symphony Orchestra. And that was, that was the benchmark for me. So to walk into those studios and, and be presented with you know, not only John Williams and George Lucas in the box and several other very famous faces put their put their heads in. Um, you know, it was it was just like a dream come true. And back to the percussion thing, one thing that really sticks in my mind, it was actually from the score to Attack of the Clones. There's that amazing um, chase through Coruscant with uh, I think the the the, uh, the bounty hunter is called Zam Vessel. If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, that cue we recorded with the full orchestra um, in the studio, various um, stemming they like to call it these days. Maybe some of the brass were recorded while everybody else sat and, and did nothing. There was an enormous percussion part in that, uh, in that particular cue. A lot of which, a lot of the, the, the sort of mallet instruments and stuff that was sort of orchestrally based was actually recorded with the, with the full orchestra. But then we'd we'd often have sessions with John, which I I just you know again I sort of pinch myself to think that they actually happen. You know, just four percussion players, John in the middle with his with his clock. Everybody else uses streamers and and very technical things. He has his clock, which is linked up to the computer. Yes, but all the little nuances of shifts of time, it it all happens on the fly with John. It's 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 just a beautiful. He's a beautiful craftsman to watch doing his work. But on this, on this particular cue, we, we just had endless overdubs of all the tom-toms and taikos and, and stuff which underpins that, that big action sequence. And it was just, like I said, I, I keep repeating myself, but it was just like all my Christmases have come at once. This is the best job in the world. Absolutely loved it. And the Mike scene during those prequels, yes, uh, there, there's some lovely photos of you meeting John Williams for the first time, and <laughs> I think you you were able to re recite, you know, your inspiration of hearing the music uh, basically made you want to play the violin. Uh, that was obviously a special time for you. Phantom Menace, wasn't it? Um, yes, I'm surprised there's never been a sort of restraining order taken out to me, to be honest, because um, I, I would always be extremely enthusiastic. Um, I mean, I can't believe I'm going to tell my parents that, you know, that Dave, David Cripps was part of this discussion. Um, I grew up in a house that basically resembles something out of Comic-Con, really. So it's, um, and the same uh, as Dave Jackson, growing up, hearing the soundtrack and and seeing it, you know, that this was the LSO, firmly put that in my mind of, well, that's that's where I want to go. And I want to work really hard to be in an orchestra that can make that kind of music and that kind of sound. So it, it was just so special. I mean, almost spoilt, in fact, because they were probably the very first film sessions um, I ever did. And they they're not, not all film sessions are run obviously in that way you don't always get the ginormous screen at the back and you're I mean quite lucky in the first violins you can sort of look over and see what's what's going on um on the screen and just seeing the way that that John works is is just a sight to behold and I think um as David Cripps said a bit earlier I remember something that John Williams said, um, you know, he's exacting. He wants to get everything absolutely perfect. You know, he hears things that, you know, you, it, 
you just think, gosh, how did he even hear that somebody was not quite right there? And and I remember he putting it into a perspective. He said, more people are going to hear, actually, he said, amazingly enough, this soundtrack than the entirety of the amount of people that will hit, come to a concert, basically, in London all year. And I thought, yeah, he's right, actually. The, the, the you know, vastness of his of the popularity and and the longevity that this music has held for that it can be that it can strike such passion in people and be so integrated in the story is something that I I remember and and Dave saying about the the from the attack of the claims the battle um scene I I it's funny I really remember that one clearly because I thought wow there's a lot of there's a lot going on in this scene and I, I probably didn't have time to keep looking. <laughs> and I, you know, we were, and I thought I'll go into the box, you know, which we would sometimes do in a listening break, always crowded on Star Wars sessions, obviously, because we all want to see what's happening. And I went in and I thought, oh, I couldn't believe that every hit was part of something on screen, you know, a lightsaber, um, this act, you know, someone jumping. And I just thought, this is just, I just couldn't believe how it was all fitting in it, it's really something to behold um being a part of those sessions and and for something which is such a huge part of of the lso's history to to have even said you know i mean not it's it not to have been obviously a part of the the films in the 70s and 80s but still to have, have just been a part of this amazing history of for me what is a real pinnacle of film music is I, I still can't believe it and it and it is what a lot of people sort of recognize the LSO for still yeah absolutely it's very true also I think that um the way John uh, writes for for the orchestra is really informed by the people who write he writes for I mean, and not just, I mean, soloists or, or big names, but namely also people working in the orchestras. And I think that we can make a statement by saying that uh, the sound of those scores, especially after Star Wars, and we can we can cite, of course, Superman, for example, which was the very first after Star Wars. You wrote in that way because he knew that he had David Cripps and Anthony Camden and Peter Lloyd and all those incredible musician and first chairs, but also sections of the orchestra. So that was probably something that informed his way of writing. And I'd love to ask, for example, to Sir Clive, how much John did change over the years his approach with the orchestra? So did you notice any evolution in his way of conducting or maybe just relating with the people in the orchestra? Well, I think the wonderful thing about John was as has been said a few times, he was so humble. And, you know, he asked for everything, you know, in such a sort of quiet, gentle way, you know, which was so different from a lot of the conductors of the age. Um, <clears throat> but I think very clearly, he both understood the great strengths of the orchestra, and you're right, it's not just the principal players, it was different sections as well. Um, but you know, for me, uh, I'd love to just go back a second to, because somebody was talking about his humility earlier. And there's one story he told me, which was about himself. I mean, very self-deprecating, as always with John. And, and it was when he was asked to write the music for Schindler's List um, by Steven Spielberg. And, and he saw the film and he was in tears at the end. And he said to Steven, look, I'm sorry, Steven, this film is far too great. I, you need a far greater composer than me to do this. And Stephen looked at him very sadly and said, I know, John, but they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and he actually, I mean, Steven Spielberg absolutely worships John. And I remember, you know, one of our later films at the LSO, when I was manager by that time, and I went in, I was in the box um, in the recording booth, and they were holding the start of the session up and somebody was dialing up on the phone. And I wondered what on earth was going on. And then it, eventually they got through on the phone, they held the phone up and John started. And it turned out, I asked afterwards what this was about. And John, it turns out that Steven Spielberg said, wherever I am in the world, I don't care whether I'm asleep, I'm awake, in the middle of anything, 
I want to hear the first sounds of every John Williams film, um, you know, before anybody else has heard it. And, and so this happens with every single John Williams film. I mean, these are all examples of, you know, how everybody he worked with, it wasn't just us in the orchestra, how everybody loves and reveres him. And I would say the whole thing about symphony orchestras being central to the music of films has probably been something that has lasted far, far longer and kept away from synthesizers and everything just because of John and his unbelievable use of the orchestra. That's absolutely true. And I was thinking also um, to the fact that uh, what put uh, the LSO into a higher prestige status than it already was, was the fact that all these movies were, of course, huge hits with the audience. And and I do distinctly remember back in the day uh, that it was a kind of a point of prestige for any movie to have a soundtrack album to say music performed by the London Symphony Orchestra. So that attracted many other film composers to, you know, to, to want to work with that orchestra. And I'd love to ask to Sue, do you remember distinctly when was the moment when the LSO started to get more requests from other composers to, to work uh, with you? Well, our history with film music goes way back. And I think that certainly John put us on a whole new map. But I think what's been admired um, by virtually every composer, conductor who comes and works with us is the versatility that the LSO has. They're like a chameleon. They can adapt, whether it's jazzy, uh, whatever genre is there, they adapt instantly. And I suppose, yes, because so, you know, our history with John started in uh, 77 um, and we last saw, saw him, I think, 2005. But I think probably the heyday for the commercial work was probably the 80s. I don't know what you think, Clive, but I can remember so much commercial work and so much film work. And in those days, the technology wasn't available to the director to alter films at the last minute. So with Star Wars, you know, we'd finish one set of uh, sessions and we used to have what, 15, 18 sessions per film approximately. Um, and then three years later, they would put, they would program the next film the moment we had finished that particular one. And it, it never changed. You know, you could rely on the films. So as, the, as we worked through, you know, the whole six of them, they didn't move at all. They were completely reliable. And as I say, in the 80s was probably the heyday for the LSO with the commercial work. Um, the difficulty nowadays is that technology's changed and directors make last minute changes and your sessions are never safe. They will move time and time again. So sadly, um, we don't have the flexibility now. So I would say probably, yes, it was the 80s that really uh, saw the LSO on that film map. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I distinctly remember some of the scores by the, the late, great James Horner, which was another great friend of the LSO. And he was starting to work really with a great frequency with the orchestra throughout the 80s and then even afterwards. But the interesting thing about James's music, everything hinged on synthesizers. You know, he would have a bank of synths in the control room. And that was the huge difference between James's music and John's music. You can't really perform the James Horner scores because it's they are reliant on the synth. But with John, you can do you can perform any of his hits. But that, that's an interesting difference, actually, between the two composers. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting you say that. That was one of the reasons. Uh, I remember Simon Rhodes, the scoring mixer, telling, telling me that one of the reasons that it took so long for James Horner to, to have a concert of his work done, which, as it happened, it turned out to be in Vienna, 
was uh, due to the electronic kind of uh, elements to a, a concert environment, which, you know, is something which made it obviously te technically quite difficult for a big kind of concert of his film music. But, um, you know, whenever you say about the 80s, Sue, it's, it's, it's a good, I think, segue, isn't it, Maurizio, to talk about, as you say, you know, the, the albums and the other projects. I mean, we've got 40 years of Raiders of the Lost Ark this year. Wonderful, uh, again, iconic score, David Cripps, um, some incredible, very topsy solos during like the desert chase, all, all that fantastic kinetic energy of the action scenes. And there was also the Lena Slatkin conducting the LSO with the wonderful violin concerto and the flute concerto showcasing Peter Lloyd, of course. Um, and, you know, during that, the, I suppose the 81, it would be, interesting to hear about some of those albums. I mean, Clive, Sue, David, can you recall, let's start with Raiders, uh, you know, for, can you recall some of that? I mean, what, what a classic film. Raiders, that was the one, the first one we did at Abbey Road Studios, am I right? Mm. I think so, yes. Yeah. Because Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back were at uh, Anvil Studios in Denver. And Dracula too. And Dracula too was with the Abbey Road because they pulled down the studios in Denham. And by that time, it became very clear to me that John was actually writing with the LSO and our players and our sections clearly in mind, because it seemed to me that the <laughs> all the music got more and more difficult to play. <laughs> in this regard, I I prepared a very short excerpt from the Raiders of the Lost Ark school and actually the cue that Tim was mentioning, the big desert chase uh, in the middle of the movie, the big action set piece. And it's really an astonishing piece of music. It's a very long, it's eight minutes, but we, here it's just one minute, but it's enough to understand the power, especially in the brass section, but also, you know, all the section basically. So let's hear the desert chase.
that's some incredible playing, I think, from, you know, especially the brass, of course, we, we already mentioned him, but it's really, uh, I think, due to, to remember Maurice Murphy, first chair trumpet of the LSO back in the day, uh, and because I think he was essential for to bring out that really heroic character in most of John's music, you know, especially the Raiders March, but also Superman and, and Star Wars, of course. Maurice was uh, was very very special as a musician, as a player, <clears throat> and also as a person. One of the most generous people I've ever met. Generous with his money, with his praise, whatever. Um, if you go into a bar with Maurice Murphy, don't expect to pay. Not without a fight, anyway. Um, he was always first to put his hand in his pocket, and. He was just a lovely, lovely character. And this has been a, um, a thing of mine throughout my life, is that so many of the greatest musicians that I've worked with have been modest, they've been humble, and they've been easy to approach and not with their heads in the clouds wanting to be worshipped. They've just been down-to-earth, wonderful people. And I'm sure... You two of the younger generation would would probably say the same thing now, and and I know Clive and Sue would would, would agree with me as well. They're so so approachable. One of the great things about Morris was, in fact, I don't know whether you know that Star Wars was his very first date with the LSO as principal mm -hmm. trumpet, and I remember being on the board when we were trying to appoint him, and we had lots of discussions. He was playing in the Halley. And, and so we involved Mike Davis, who used to be in the Halley, because his big thing was, can I trust these Southerners? Um, you know, he, he, had no, he, he sort of felt very confident about being a Northerner, um, but, you know, thought Southerners were very untrustworthy. In the end, we persuaded him to come. And the very first notes he ever played were the part that you played us right earlier on um, in this talk. Um, those were his first notes as an LSO player. And and he was a superstar. I mean, I think his legacy probably is as great in John Williams' films as it is in any other part of his life. Both Maxine and I are very, very fortunate in, in that we came into the orchestra in the mid-90s, early 90s, myself, mid, mid to late for, for Max. But we had time in the orchestra with these great players who sadly are no longer with us and you know again listening to that Raiders excerpt there I funnily enough I watched Raiders the other night on one of the streaming services and I always get a lump in my throat when I hear the, the main theme and because I've sat in the studio next to these guys Morris particularly watch them do what they do and, and David's absolutely right what in, in many many ways Morris and John were cut from the same cloth, in my opinion. And boy, did they get on like a house on fire from what I saw. You know, they were like school kids, old pals, when we when we met up again at Abbey Road. You know, if you're ever in Beverly Hills, come and have a round of golf with me, Morris. And, you know, Morris was a very keen golfer. Just wonderful to be part of that legacy as well, not only with the relationship with John, of course, but also for me as a, a sort of younger, uh, youngish member of the orchestra these days, to have the legacy of those people who did play on all those great soundtracks, it, it, you know, it's thrilling for me. But, it, you know, as, as we were saying about the 80s, and I think, again, whenever Clive and Sue, you were talking about the, the importance and the, the special uh, moments of the, the concert performance and you know I remember the 1996 concerts so fondly and, uh, and there was a great tagline that you all you used in publicity was it was an adrenaline adrenaline pumping experience uh, having John Williams and the NSO perform together in, in a concert and I, it'd be interesting to chat to us about because whenever Williams was in working with you in London you always did try and organize a concert didn't you I mean between you both you tried to schedule it I mean was that always, was it tricky logistically? I mean, it usually worked out, didn't it? Well, if if John was in town, we had we had to try and organise a concert, but it, but it was a tricky business because he was in such demand. And 
you know, Steven Spielberg just had to click his fingers and John would go and do whatever he was bidden to do. Um, so, but he, John was actually very loyal. It's interesting because he, even with his engineers, I mean, it was Eric Tomlinson for years and years and years, and then Sean Murphy from America came over. But he was loyal to everybody and he did his best to try and honor the dates that we um, set up for him. But, you know, later on, he was in such demand and had such a schedule that it, it did get more difficult, without doubt. I mean, it's interesting because, um, I mean, I'm quite proud that the LSO, I always think of it as a Star Wars orchestra. And the first time we went to China uh, in our centenary, um, we actually took Star Wars main theme as an encore, sort of after Marla Five. Yes, of course, encore. Oh. <laughs> you know, in fact, when we were in China, the audiences were shouting out for Star Wars. And when, I remember taking it to Korea and somebody was um, uh, uh, tweeting in Korea saying, I came to the concert last night and heard Star Wars. I booked another ticket just in the hope they'll play it again. As an encore. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> You know, I mean, it's interesting because some some conductors, I think, would be quite shocked that Star Wars was the recogn a recognised encore. But I think we felt it was a we we had it as a badge of pride, and the and it brought the house down every time. And in fact, and it's on great that, music. it's great music. It's great music. <laughs> but sadly, it's film music. But actually, it deserves to be. On the on the same platform as you know as as our concerts and in fact on that centenary tour to China it was Morris Murphy um, he was on that tour and I don't know whether you remember um, but in fact it was Rolls Royce's centenary and it was Daniel Harding conducting and James Richards who was worked for Rolls Royce at the time spoke fluent um, Chinese and he introduced the LSO with Star Wars, but he always introduced Morris Murphy and saying, you are listening to a bit of history here, you know. Well, one of the, the best concert experiences uh, you, you'll both recall is 1998, you had quite a coup because you had that wonderful Inventing America season where you had him doing four concerts, which uh, at such a wide variety of his work, it wasn't just his film work, you had you know, the Tuba Concerto with fantastic Patrick um, premiere, the Tuba Concerto. Um, and you also had, you know, the, the, the Reavers with Oliver Ford Davis doing live narration. And well, was it that year as well you went to Symphony Hall Birmingham? Because he, he really wanted, he wanted to experience yes, Birmingham Symphony did, Hall, didn't he? Did, he did go to Birmingham, yes. And that, because, and he asked for that especially, is that right? Or did you encourage him because he heard it was such a great hall? I think we asked him if he'd like to go <clears throat> and said, you know, there's this, there's this new hall in Birmingham and it's a great hall. And I, 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 he was very happy to go. I'd love to ask to, to Sue, uh, because there's a, a, quite a big gap between 1983 and then 1996, which was the return uh, of John with the LSO with the concerts. And then, of course, 1999 with the Star Wars prequels beginning. But do you remember if you did ever discussed any projects in between in those time frame between the late 80s, early 90s to, to do maybe more film work? No, but John was, I think I'm right in saying, not enjoying the transatlantic flight flights. He really didn't like the long haul flights, um, sadly. Uh, so he, I think, concentrated most of his work in L.A. Um, Ooh, I've got a feeling one other bit was the Boston Pops um, that took a huge amount of his time. It, ch yes, it changed his true. life as well. Yeah. yeah, it was a combination of that and, and, the, and the dislike of the, of the long haul flights. So how, how did it feel when finally you got him back uh, to, to record the new, the new Star Wars movies in 99. I mean, 
Uh, do you remember any special electricity in the air the first time you went into the studio? Everybody was just thrilled. <laughs> That's all I can say. They were so pleased to see him. Um, and it's funny because he, he never seemed to age. That was the other interesting thing. And even when we saw him in 2015 um, at Disney Hall, you know, it was the same John, the same sort of, uh, because he, he is such a gentleman. He, he, he never aged in, in my book. He, he was always the same, but it was fabulous to see him. I think that everybody just couldn't wait. There was that wonderful moment, I think it's on one of the, um, the DVD documentaries, where we were re-recording um, one of the, cl the closing of the, of, of the first film, and it has a montage of lots of, um, lots of previous work. Maybe, maybe it was even Revenge of the Sith, or I can't remember exactly, but um, we got to a big climax in the, in the recording, um, and the LSO has this, this kind of tradition of cheering and clapping at the, the, the big crowd scene moments. And we got to the, the top of this crescendo and the whole orchestra started cheering. And the look on John's face, I don't think he quite knew what was going on, but it, I, I think it was just everybody, an outpouring of, we've got you, but we, we feel at home again. You know, the orchestra feels at home again. It was a wonderful moment. And I, I, it, I think it appears somewhere on one of the documentaries. Yes, it's on, I think it was episode three. It uh, was, maybe, yeah. maybe maybe because it was the last back then. He, he maybe he thought he was finished with Star Wars, but he says that nice, lovely <laughs> thing. <laughs> he says that nice, lovely thing. It's twenty five years later. I'm still doing this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We do that in in classical music. In moments, you know, they come around in you know Mahler and things. It just felt like the most normal thing to do, even if we were going, we were potentially obviously ruining a take. And <laughs> it just sort of welled up and it just happened, um, which, which was always fun because he, he's so ever so professional, obviously, all the time to the point that, I mean, my first memories were, um, you know, and being in the LSO, I obviously I've met so many of my sort of childhood heroes, whether they are violinists I've, I've seen growing up. Um, and my first sort of impression of John Williams, I was a bit like, God, I'm a bit scared, actually, because he he has a very a professional way of being. It's all very, you know, let's do this. And um, I mean, I'm kind of known for um, going to harass people. At that time, I had an autograph, but, you know, no smartphones, no sort of easy cameras to take. So I, I have um, a fabulous autograph book that I will look back on. And, and obviously now it's it's the selfie. But I, I remember being so churned up thinking, I really, really want to get John Williams autograph. Um, but I really have to pick my moment here. And obviously we were there over, you know, a week and things. And I managed to catch him, what we see, um, in a little break. And, and, and amazingly enough, a colleague happened who, um, Mike Humphrey, who actually took the sort of famous picture of us at Abbey Road um, Studios, he he took it. Yes, that's one. I have to have <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, he actually, I I didn't know it was happening, but I, I was getting him to sign um, also actually a, this CD cover for my dad, and 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 he snapped a photo during it, and and I was just I was so nervous. I can still remember sort of feeling like really shaky, but he, and he was saying, "Oh, is this your dad?" And I was like, "Oh, is he a huge Star Wars fan?" And he, he loves the music, and he was like, "Oh, you must be so proud. He must be so proud of you to to be in the LSO." And and I was just like so taken aback. Um, but he's just such a, a lovely, gentle sort of soul. But but on the podium, I mean, it's just incredible the amount of work we get through. And actually hearing, you know, some of the clips you've played, it's, you know, you can often look at people's music and you don't get obviously a chance to practice it. And as a violinist, you know, you have things like Hedwig's theme that you just put on the and you go like, what is this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's like, right, red light on and you're like, okay. But actually, from everybody I've sort of spoken to, he seems to write really well for every instrument. It's no, no one's a filler. That it's everybody has an amazing part to play, and it just sort of works. That his knowledge of instrumentation is 
it's just incredible and I, I've never seen anything like it every, every note should be there it's not just a case of well let's just give them a sort of you know intro filler but um it's yeah it's just just incredible everything that about him oh you can tell I'm a huge fan <laughs> <laughs> no I, I love how you said that though because there's a great Richard Kaufman who you all know because I know he's, he's worked with you a few times he has this great analogy he says you know with Williams music it's it's like you know you know you might hear a lead solo but uh underneath that there's a whole city underground with so much going on you know and whenever he rehearses with different orchestras across the world he always lets the orchestra hear right let's just have violas just woodwinds so everyone can actually hear and it's it's, it's fascinating you know if you're not reading the music or the actual manuscripts it's sometimes it's it's you need to be hearing it like that, having it all kind of isolated. And, uh, you know, I love how with the prequel Star Wars films and also with Harry Potter, thankfully there was always a kind of camera crew following you all. You know, we have, uh, you know, there's even shots of you, Sue, in the booth drinking tea, it's great. I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've ever seen those uh, shots, but, the, you know, the, the crew is, is there filming uh, everything and it's great. And of course, you, you made VH1 and MTV. You know, that was a big deal, do you remember that? Duel of the Fates. It was this four minute video that went global. I mean, David Cripps and, and Sir Clive, obviously you, were, you guys are there, but I mean, David Cripps, you, you must remember seeing that on mainstream TV and was it nice seeing all your old colleagues again on, on like mainstream, this pop video? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, I, I would like to, the, there's just something that's a, occurred to me about John and it, it goes back to what um, you were saying about, um, uh, I think Sue was saying that with say James Horner, there's always synthesizers involved, many of them. And John is just not like that at all. And it brings to mind um, that I was chatting in Hollywood in the studios to Don Williams, who's uh, John's brother. And he is a, um, a session percussionist, of course. Uh, um, and he's, he's a, a wonderful guy as well. But we had a chat and I, I just said to Don, so, um, you know, your brother doesn't seem to do very much with computers or th synthesizers or anything. And he said, oh, no, no. He said, I'm not, I'm still not sure if he even owns a computer, if he ever has. And he said, his instrument is the piano. And he said, John's day, he said, it's very disciplined. And this goes to the way that he works with an orchestra. It's very disciplined and he just enjoys what he does. He gets up in the morning and he will set a time limit for composing. He aims to write so many bars of music each morning. And that's writing in the full score, just sitting at his grand piano. In the afternoon, he rests and goes for a walk. And then after dinner, he spends every evening playing the piano. And he said his, his, uh, his music room is absolutely full of piles of music. It could be jazz, it could be rock, it could be Haydn or Beethoven or whatever. And he, he'll just pick up anything. And he plays for his own enjoyment and pleasure all evening. And that's a typical day at home for John. And so I think um, when Maxine, you were talking about his, his gift for instrumentation and things, I think it, all it comes down to is the fact that he is the consummate musician. Of course, he has this great inspiration to be able to compose tunes and, 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 and put things together um, to compose mood, mood music for, for, um, for movies and anything else. But what it really comes down to is this idea that he is a musician's musician. That's how I have always viewed him. And that's why, um, that's why he is such a, a, a disciplined artist to work with. He never raises his voice or anything like that because he knows what he wants. He knows how it he, he can hear what he's written in his head before you play it. And all he has to do is to try and communicate that to the musicians in front of him. 
there's nobody nobody who's better at that than he is. That's a wonderful summation, absolutely. And, and to return to the Phantom Menace, uh, I'd love to play you a, a, another sh very short clip from the, from the score of episode one, The Phantom Menace, because I think it's a great testament of how John, again, was ready to write for that specific orchestra. This is a very short action sequence from, from the prequels, and, um, and this, I think it's an astonishing example of him being able to, uh, you know, to, to write specifically and idiomatically for every instrument and every section of the orchestra. Of course, it's an action cue, so it's very, you know, energetic and highly charged. But I'd love, after we play this, to talk with, especially with David Jackson, because there is a very interesting percussion part here. Murphy, what a guy! <laughs> Such a spine tingling sound, isn't it? Like, yeah, and the sonic of Abbey Road were marvelously captured by by Sean Murphy here. But but uh, was Kurt Hans Gerdig uh, still there when when he recorded Phantom Menace? Kurt did play episode one, yes. Um, and again, you know, much like David, much like Morris, I'd grown up listening to his timpani playing on the uh, on the the original soundtrack recordings. There are various stories of how many timpani. I mean, I've seen various threads on on websites saying what well, he had at least eleven timpani for 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 um, the original Star Wars, which wasn't the case at all. Maybe he had six, but it certainly wasn't eleven. But again, it was ju it's just an amazing thing to sit in the same section in the same orchestra as these players that you've just grown up idolizing the whole time um you know i mean he he was we all have our idiosyncrasies and and kurt had a very particular style that um you know was was hugely admired by players of my generation formative generation um you know everybody wanted to play Timpani in Star Wars and be like Kurt Hans Gerdiker. It was it was a again something to aspire to. I, I, I remember specifically that particular cue. I'm playing all the xylophone in that one. Wow! Um, but wow. it's it's all those. What I think is brilliant, aside from the where I've sort of got the main theme there. What's what is so striking is all the all the times where the orchestration is is doubling the woodwind. All those little stab things that. It, it just, it's so John Williams. There's a few licks, if you like, in, in his percussion writing. The sort of bass drum just before the piatti, um, you know, maybe a offset by a quaver, which is just, it's so signature. And hearing hearing that again, 
now I've not listened to that for a little little while. Um, you know, it's it's just instantly recognizable as as John's writing. All the, the the way it's orchestrated, the way he picks certain sections and puts them together to make an impact. I mean, it's just it's it's real craftsmanship, real craftsmanship. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's also interesting because he often takes a very maybe a short motif, like in this case, is a very short rhythmical figure, but he builds all this incredible, you know, he has a way of crafting tension and release. And he knows very well when when to get you very excited and when to give you that moment of exhilaration when the full, for example, the trumpet sections comes in in full blast. It's really perfect. And of course, we know that he does this because he's following uh, a narrative, a, a storytelling, but he he's always very careful about the needs of the music, if you know what I mean, in the sense that it's not just mere accompaniment. He's always to take care always of the needs of the music because he probably, you know, he knows that there are live people playing this, so he wants to give the musicians interesting music enough to be performed and to, you know, to get engaged with. Absolutely, yeah. Like I say, just, just a real... What he... Actually, it was interesting to listen to what David David said about his manner on the podium. Um, he's so reserved. You know, you, you'd think in a in a queue like that that there'd be histrionics from the from the, from the middle. It's very measured. It's very contained. I mean, we, obviously we have a click track going in our ears, but you know, you want you you, you would imagine that all that energy needed to be channeled, but it was. It's latent energy with John. And, you know, think about building tension. He only needs to, like, like all the truly great com, uh, conductors, it only needs to be a little bit of adjustment to really lift the, the, the players in front of them to something more. And when, when somebody is that disciplined and that, um, I don't want to, I wouldn't go as far as to say restrained because you could see that he was, enjoying it concentrating yes but enjoying it in 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 a in a in a great way but you'd only need to do something slightly more um from a gesture point of view and the, the whole orchestra would respond you know it's a, it's a bit like must be like driving a i imagine like driving a ferrari you know you dab the accelerator just a tiny bit and suddenly all this all this action happens but the way that he's able to sort of channel that into a you know what is a very high pressure environment working on a on a film score is very time sensitive there's a lot of money involved if if things go over time and things like that so you know he knows he's got a very um serious job to do but you know if, if you're do, if if, it, if it's anything like me as a player you want to enjoy every minute of that amazing job and he, he certainly does that one of our favorite albums uh, it was just after superman so we're going back a little bit for sir clive sue and david cripps the uh, the fury that was recorded in uh, all saints church in tooting and uh, do you remember that i mean i know it's so long ago but i mean that was such an incredible album um because he actually came over especially i think there was sessions left over from superman and he wanted to make this album at all saints church and because of the kind of sound and uh, do, you, do you recall those sessions by any chance? I certainly recall All Saints tooting. <laughs> <laughs> old in there. Even I recall All Saints tooting. <laughs> <laughs> Could I just add one little piece, which I think we haven't touched on, which is there are a lot of people who write very fine film music, but there is nobody who writes music where you can just listen to a two, three seconds and you know exactly which film it is. He conjures up a picture and you instantly have the feeling of that film. Um, I don't think anybody else has that ability to be a different composer for every different film. And, you know, and that is quite astonishing, his ability to do that. Yes. His, his music, I think, lives on because not only accompanied some of the most um, some of the greatest movies of the past uh, 40 50 years 
but also because it's very fine music. I mean, uh, if it wouldn't be very fine music, we wouldn't be here talking about it. It's it, it lives on even beyond some of these movies because, of course, we are talking about Star Wars or Indiana Jones, which of course are very beloved. But of course, John's filmography is huge. And if we go through it, we find maybe some lesser known works that were written maybe for some, we could say minor movies. But if we look at the scores, it's just absolutely stunning music. Like Tim was saying, The Fury or another of great LSO John, John Williams collaboration was a very obscure mu movie called Monsignor starring Christopher Reeve uh, playing as a, as a priest. And, and there are some incredible trumpet solos by Maurice Murphy over in that score. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous album. And and to try and to cap off our conversation, I'd like to ask maybe to Sue, uh, are there maybe any further plans for future concerts, future recordings with John? Well, John will be, well, he'll be 90, won't he, next, next year? Next February, yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I have a, sad feeling that you know he's not going to come over to europe is he um actually one i, I think that morris used to refer to him as the governor didn't he that's what he called him the governor and that just about sums sums him up really i mean <laughs> as clive says you know you can go into a film and then you can come out and you can hum all the themes because they're so memorable and I can't think of another composer where you can do that. Yeah. But I, yes, I mean, certainly his music is going to live on forever. I mean, there is no doubt about it. Everybody was really hyped up for the concert that we did at the Royal Albert Hall a couple of years ago. And very sadly, John was taken ill just before. The concert went ahead um, with a, a great friend of the orchestra, Dirk Brosse, conducting was undeniably a huge success but we all felt in the orchestra a, a huge pang of sadness knowing that possibly that was that was going to be our last uh, last chance saloon to, to to work with john uh, i know he went over to vienna um not so long ago but um you know we we, we live in hope but um I, I i think those of us who who worked with him on the, on the films uh, you know, we, we, we will cherish those memories uh, for the rest of our lives. It was a stroke of genius that night. I don't know whose decision it was, but having you all as musicians stand up and talk about working with you, know, it was a fantastic move. It really <laughs> was. Of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was brilliant, though, because the audience was so engaged and, you know, you could hear a pin drop and Ron Abbott, as you well know, is <laughs> not an easy thing to do. I, uh, Previous, though, I, I what was I mean? I'm so glad it was so last minute. In that, obviously, you know, John had been taken to hospital. He was in London, and and then we decided to, um, in to turn it into a our stories and our memories of working with John. And the the number before I was due to stand up and speak um, was Dracula. And I can honestly say I can barely remember anything about playing that because all I was thinking was I have to now pick up the microphone and stand up and address 7,000 people and it's going live on the radio. So I just remember I was going through the motions and, and amazing score, Dracula. I, it wasn't something that um, I particularly knew, but um, at, on that night, I just, I sort of thought, oh my goodness, it's now. But, but then I suppose, as I said at the beginning, when you're enthusiastic about something and when you have such great memories about something, it, you, it all ceases to exist. You, I just sort of blurted everything out about what I loved about him. and um... Very eloquent it was, Max. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're in the audience, I think it was a great tribute to John because nobody wanted their money back. That was interesting because Vienna cancelled. They decided they couldn't go ahead when he went ill. But we said, look, you know, we are the Star Wars Orchestra. We know this man. We all love him. We the can force was with us. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put. It was a fantastic concert. I was oh, there was. and the team was there too, you know. 
uh, we, we were there together and, and I, I distinctly remember that the performance was really, really heartfelt. And, and I know it's a manner of saying, but you really did, you, you really did play your hearts out in the, on that night. Absolutely. For myself, I don't know if John will be watching any of this, but if he is, I would simply like to say to John, on behalf of me and many, many other countless horn players, thank you. That's a lovely way, I think, to, to round up this, this lovely, lovely evening that we spent all together. I really want to thank you all of you from, from the bottom of my heart for accepting to be part of this special celebration of John Williams and the London Symphony Orchestra. Thank you very much for sharing all these beautiful stories and memories. Uh, I want to really to thank everyone who participated. Um, David Cripps, thank you very much for, for, for being here with us. You're very welcome. And uh, I've enjoyed it immensely and I've enjoyed connecting with old friends and new. Sir Clive Gillinson, thank you, Clive, for, for being with us too. I mean, I've loved it. John has been such an important part of my life and I almost dread to admit it in this company. David Jackson, thank you very much for sharing all your stories and for being with us. Huge pleasure. I, I, actually, I can't think of a nicer way to spend an evening than talking about working with, with, with one of my great heroes. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And Maxine, thank you very much also for, for being with us and, and, and thank you very much for, for, for staying with, with us. Thank you for inviting me. A, re a real pleasure. I'm absolutely buzzing now. It's quite late in London, but I, I just, I'm just full of, like, of, of this energy. So thank you. And, and Sue, Sue Mallet, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, to, to have also you such an historic memory of, of the orchestra. Well, I mean, you know, if anybody says, who do you feel most privileged to have ever worked with? It, John's up there because... He is iconic. Tim Burden, thank you for again for another adventure together. It's been so nice to have you here with me. Oh, it's been lovely. Eliso is such a massive part of my life due to my family history. So it's lovely talking to you all and, and, and being with you. And it's uh, it's something really special to celebrate. So thanks again to all of you. And thanks, Maurizio. OK, thank you very much, all of you. and. Uh... You know, as they say, may the force be with you all. <laughs> <laughs>